to thank you for your hearts of worship. And you come here hungry every week to just worship God together. That is such an important core part of who we are. And we thank you for doing that and for just being so open to the Spirit of God in those moments. I love it. And I just feel like there's no other place where you can go. I just feel, miss you guys so much when I'm not here. So we thank you for if you're visiting. My name's Harry, one of the pastors here at Mosaic. And we invite you, come join us. You know, come, keep coming and visiting. And you got to stay for a while to kind of get us, don't, don't people, all right? It's like sometimes it takes six weeks, sometimes six months, sometimes six years. But, uh, you know, just keep trying us out. And it'll slowly, you'll, you'll begin to understand just the uniqueness of this body because it's been intentionally shaped since day one to look like the end of the story, Revelation 7, 9, some from every tongue, tribe, nation, and people gathering to worship the Lord. And that's what we hope we model here week after week after week. And we can't do it without you. So thank you for continuing to do that. We've been on this series called from where the tree goes, I, grows, I introduced this last Sunday, and we're talking a lot about just the fruitfulness of ministry, and what does it take to till the soil that would allow God to grow up, um, have fruitful ministry, and we talked about how each of us in the room as a member of the body of Christ have both individual responsibilities and collective responsibilities. We can't take either one for granted and we must do them all, okay? And we talked about how that kind of leads us to like a propensity. If you may really enjoy the individualistic kind of activities where you're focused on your prayer life, your own individual walk with God, and all those things, whereas others really like the corporate collectivistic kind of worship and our, and our mission together as the body of Christ. And what we try to say is, you know, those two perspectives have kind of categorized people to a certain degree to like one or the other, and it's really the great divide in this country is between those who prefer the individualist type of perspective to those who are thinking always the, from a collectivist point of view. And it's the difference between what is my responsibility and my right versus what is our responsibility together and neither is right or wrong. They're just different. And our job is how do we become united as the body of Christ across these growing divides? And that's kind of where we ended last week. And I told you, you know, as, a, as I've traveled around the country, the number one issue I see is really around this thing called family. And how do we define it? And how others define it? And just the way our upbringing has given us such a different perspective on what it even means and how it's lived out. And today, we want to clarify all of that with a word from God on how He defines family. And so if you have a handout, I've given you the handout from last week and this week. And you know, I give you those handouts so that you'll take it home, you'll chew on it, you'll meditate on it, you'll rethink and restudy those verses, reread them, and let it seep into your soul. You know, I was telling the first service, we only have like 30 minutes here to deliver a sermon, right? And and if you're the kind that always says, I come to church to be fed, But then you go home and you don't listen or read the Bible. You don't listen to anything else. You just go and live life. And then you come back here expecting to be fed and for that to last you throughout the week. That is not the church's fault. Okay. Your job is to go home and to keep eating. We're we're trying to inspire you to go home and eat so that when you come back, you're not emaciated. You're full and overflowing and you're ready to impact everybody. And so take that home, read it, study it, keep meditating on it and figure out how is God applying this to me, both as an individual and as a important part of the collective body. So today, as we continue this study, we're gonna look in John chapter one in a moment. 
the bottom line question is this. To what degree are you willing to love others in the body of Christ for the greater good? To what degree? You may, may not have thought about that before. How far are you willing to go to both impact the body of Christ based on who you are and your gifting for the gospel's sake, for the name of Christ, for the kingdom's sake? How far? Have you ever thought about it? A lot of it has to do with the way we define family. Because if I were to ask each of you, how do you define family? On one end of the spectrum, somebody would say, oh, well, it's easy. It's just who's living with me under my roof, right? It's nuclear. It's my siblings. It's my parents. And, and for some, it'd be like, yes, yeah, who I have listed as on my tax return. That's who I'm legally obligated for. That's my family. That's it. And it's, it tends to be close, tight-knit, smaller numbers. Where if you go to the other end of the spectrum and you go, how do you define family and who gets in and how do they get in? It would be, well, it's whoever wants to be a part of the family, right? It's the village. It's my tribe. It's anybody that comes and has dinner with me that wants to be a part of my life, they're in. And just those two simple views clash somewhere in the middle, especially when it comes to how far are we willing to go? And if you were to ask the question, am I my brother's keeper? You would get very, very mixed answers, right? On one end would go something like this. Well, it depends on how you define the word brother, right? <laughs> and the other end would go something like this. Of course, we're my brother's keeper. Why wouldn't we be? They're part of the village. They're part of our family. And so the degree that those two are lived out every day will determine like the amount of clash that happens in the middle as you try where those two compete. Because there's gonna be decisions made where you're gonna disagree. Ah, that's his responsibility or no, that's our responsibility. And on and on it goes. And both sides have good views. I'm not saying either side is wrong or right. They're just so different, but we become a little bit jaded when we don't understand it and we start becoming critical of it, okay? And that's the part where we need to see what God's Word says so that when those things do happen, we can see this is just a difference of perspective before it becomes personally offensive, all right? So, how does God define family? Let's look at this passage in John chapter 1. It's a really great passage, and it really shows us how he defines it and how we try to define it, okay? Let's start off. The true light, which is Christ, which gives us, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. So notice the first thing about it says about Christ. One, he was the true light. What does that mean? It's referring to the exactness of Christ to displaying for us who God is. The word true light is referring to the fact that Christ was the image of the invisible God. It's referring to the fact that Christ exhibited the full radiance of God's glory. It's referring to the fact that Christ is the exact imprint of God's nature. That's the true light. And what it refers to is God, Christ came down and gave everybody the understanding of who God was based on who Christ is. Okay, everybody with me so far? Notice this, he was rejected. By whom? Almost everybody. Christ was rejected by the world who he came for, right? That's what it says. He came for everybody. And he was also rejected by his own, his own family, his own kin. His people rejected him. We need to get comfortable with that fact. 
I mean, we just need to do. Because it's a hard concept to swallow. When you think about how much we love Jesus, all right, how much we've received him, yet understand that he, when he came to this world, was outright rejected by almost everybody. And more than likely, you will be too because of him at some point by both those out there and those in your family. Get ready for that. Get comfortable with that fact. Next verse, verse 11. I love the first word, but, right? Because there's always this stuff. This is like God always leads us to think, oh man, this is so discouraging. But then he uses the word, but. Look at what it says. To all who did receive him, who believed in him, his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So not everybody rejected him, thank God. Some received him and some believed him. And to everybody that did those things, he gave the right to be called to become children of God. Now, that word right, we need to really unpack that word. Because most of you raised here in America are thinking, yeah, he gave us right. He gave us a right. And it's not the same as your right to free speech. It's not the same as your right to bear arms. It's not the same as your right to vote or whatever it is that you have tied to that word, which is so ingrained in all of us because our whole country is focused on our rights. That's why America, I showed you last week, is so highly individualistic, largely because of the fact we've been so emphasis, there's so much emphasis on our individual rights as people. And this word right is not the same word. This word refers to the awesome power and authority that Christ has bestowed on us, that has allowed us to be lifted from the pit of despair and from the domain of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of the beloved Son. That's the kind of right we're talking about. This is the kind of right that refers to the awesome power and authority that Christ has bestowed on us that would allow us to be joint heirs of an eternal inheritance. That's so much more than a bill of rights, right? This is referring to the awesome power and authority of Christ that bestowed on us righteousness that we didn't deserve or have and couldn't ever obtain. It refers to the awesome power and authority of Christ to make us acceptable before a holy God. It's the awesome power and authority that, that made you go from being an alien, estranged from God, to being his beloved son or daughter and being claimed as his child, adopted. That's a power and authority no Bill of Rights could ever give, right? So don't understate what that word means because it means a whole lot more than you naturally think. It's only because of Christ that we can stand in his presence. It's a privilege bestowed on us that only he could do. It's not about what we could receive and do ourselves. Are we clear on all that? This is so important because the awesome power and authority of Christ had led us to have the benefit of now being in the family of God, which now affords us certain things that we can't get anywhere else, okay? Look at what he says next. But to all did receive him who believed in his name. He gave the right to become children of God who were born. And then he lists three things, 
three very important things we need to unpack that too. Three things that we tend to think of instead of this awesome power and responsible authority of Christ, it is not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. So what are those three things? Let's look at the first one. These things ultimately limit how much we fully understand what it means to be a part of the family of God. Number one is our own understanding of blood. This isn't referring to the blood of Christ. This is referring to the human blood that flows through our veins. This is referring to our kin. This is our, our, own, our own, right? And this is referring to what flows and what ties us. This, this is the blood that's thicker than water that many times our family has that nobody else has. And it's a strong, strong identifier for all of us, right? When we talk about who we are, most of the times we start with, yeah, I, I, I'm fully blooded, I'm full-blooded Chinese. I just have a Southern draw. You know, I'll say something like that, right? It's, it's just the way we have come to identify who we are. And it's a strong identifier in such a way that many times, if we're not careful, it can limit our understanding of what it means to be a part of the bigger body of Christ. Because... What Christ did was so much more important and so much more powerful than what your own parents did to have you. Right? The, the power and authority of Christ to, to put us in the family of God is so much more powerful than the own, your own birth within your own family. And, and I don't know how many of you have experienced childbirth where you're seeing a child born as a parent, but it's like, how could somebody see that and not see and understand the awesome works of God through the giving of life, right? When, when that baby comes out and it's just like, wow, that's amazing. But as powerful as that is, it comes nowhere close to being as powerful as what it took for God to put you in his family. And, you know, a lot of us have a lot of different experiences with family. For some, it was full of joy and laughter and love. And for others, it was full of trauma and difficulty and abuse. And it's hard not to allow those experiences shape what we bring in here. And we just have different views about it. We need to understand that there's different views about it. And it shapes us yet it's still really important to know that this ultimately will limit how we understand what God did on our behalf. It's just like what we say about fathers, right? It's because we have our heavenly father up there who's the perfect father. Many times our view of God is limited by how our earthly father treated us. And we picture God being the same way because that's what we know. That's the way we've been conditioned. And likewise, same here for this family. But what's important to know is to not let that family experience predetermine the way that you interact with this body of Christ, okay? But know that for some people, this is the only family they have because out there, they've been rejected. Just like Christ. That's why it's so important for in here, for us to understand, we cannot limit what we understand personally into how we function within the family and the household of God. Notice the second one. Nor the will of the flesh. It's our second limitation. It's just how our flesh responds to people that we meet who say they're believers. Now, let me just ask you something. How many of you can think of, and when I say, who irritates you the most in the body of Christ? Could be somebody in this room. Could be somebody that claims Christ. But who irritates you the most, right? Who frustrates you? Who makes you mad? Who, who is so out there you don't understand them and it just frustrates you? Every time you interact with them, it's like, I don't even want to have anything to do with them anymore because it just frustrates me, frustrates me to death 
and you just don't understand. Who is it? See, that's our flesh responding in those moments. And the flesh, remember this, we talked about the flesh so many times in this church, but just remember this, the flesh always, 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 always tries to divide and tries to make you feel better about yourself than someone else. Tries to lift up self, tries to push others down, makes you think you're better than you are, tries to make yourself more comfortable, tries to find ways to think of why you shouldn't love somebody else, why you should be more selfish because of the fact that they're selfish, all the different things that divide. And the flesh is powerful, can be powerful in such a way that when somebody in the body of Christ comes up and meets you, a lot of times the flesh is like, "Uh uh-uh. Within the first 10 seconds of meeting him, hi, I'm Harry. Uh Uh-uh. You're thinking that on the inside. You know what I'm talking about, unless you guys are so spiritual, you don't have to fight that anymore, right? But our flesh has been conditioned, and so many times it reacts in the instant to form a snap judgment about somebody else that may be completely wrong and ungodly, but yet it impacts the way you interact. I was telling first service, my best friend in the entire world, his name's Richard Bowman, lives in Moscow, Idaho. And the first time I met Richard, we were at a Bible study. Somebody introduced me to him. He, he was a, he's a farmer outside the city of Moscow. He raises cattle. And he had the first time I met him, he had bib overalls on, big work boots, big gruffy beard. And the first time I met him, I was just like, farm boy. I just kind of shook my head. I shook his hand politely, but I just thought, this guy has nothing to offer me. You know, I was an engineering professor, and I was was just like, what could he possibly do to help me get tenure? You know, it was that kind of thing. But, But then like six, eight months later, we're on a men's retreat, and in the middle of the retreat, Richard says, talking about the need for men to speak into the lives of other men, he goes, no, you cannot be objective with just your wife. You need a third party who many times will say things your wife will never say to you to speak into your life because that's the way we are. We need it. And I was like, whoa, I got to get to know this guy. And so we went to breakfast, and then we went to breakfast again, and then we started hanging out. And before you know it, we've become fast friends. And for the life of us, people just used to make fun of us. It's like the geeky guy and the farmer are hanging out now. What could they possibly have in common? And you know what we had in common? Our love for the Lord and Christ. And to this day, he remains my best friend in this world. So don't make those snap judgments. Let people work their way into your life by being warm and open and and inviting in such a way that you let God do that work because you never know what blessing you're going to miss if you do that. Look at the third one. It's nor the will of man. You know what this is referring to? So, so far it's been our own blood. Secondly was our own flesh. And now it's every man-made system out there. The will of man. You know what a man-made system is? It's everything that we operate in in this world, right? The most big, the biggest one is governmental systems and politics. And you know, I alluded last week by the colors there. Notice I said, You notice that these one's red, one's blue. I said, it's kind of where I'm heading with it, but I'm not really heading there. I didn't want to just come out and say it. But there's whole political systems that are catering to the fact that there are these two main types of views in the world. One focused on individual responsibilities, one focused on collective responsibilities. And they're appealing to both and trying their hardest to separate. And what God is saying is even those man-made systems don't come close to the awesome power and authority of what my son did on your behalf to get you into this family. 
Thank God for that. But what else? You have all kinds of systems. You have economic systems. You had educational systems. You have all kinds of business systems. You name it. Theological systems, social systems, anything that causes you to categorize and say, yeah, they're in because they're part of that. And they're out because they're not. Even those kinds of connections can't stand to the power and authority of Christ who has brought you and us into the family of God. No matter how hard you want to try, any man-made system cannot put a limit on your willingness to recognize who is actually your brother and your sister. The minute you say you can't vote for X and say you're a Christian. Oh, yes, you can. And the minute you say that and believe it, you've already negated God's authority to determine who he is called into this kingdom to be your brother or sister. That's up to him, not you. So those are the three things that we try to put on there on others, but John makes it very clear. What did he say? But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. There's only one question you need to ask, and it's this, have they been born of God? If there is a stated Christian testimony of who Christ is and the fact that they've received him into their hearts, you know what? We have no choice but to obey the commandment of God, to love as we have been loved, forgive as we have been forgiven, and to accept as we have been accepted. We don't get to choose. Thank God. It'd be ridiculous for us every week to say, okay, Here's so-and-so who votes them in, who wants them. I mean, man, you're talking about divisive. You know, you know why I'm always preaching unity and to get, become one and all that? You know why I'm just constantly preaching about that? Because out there, you're constantly getting bombarded by the opposite message. And I want to make sure that that just keeps resonating with you that there's greater things at work here that can bring us together, unite us as one. You know, um, about two years ago, a church is a large church. They were planting a downtown campus in a very urban area in a big city. And they called and asked if we could come and help them because they were having so much divisiveness in this campus that was largely an urban campus the staff were, were a lot of millennial type, young, largely Caucasian, and it got so divisive that they won. They called us to help. Can you help us kind of figure this out? But secondly, they said, you know, it's gotten to the point of, especially on these race issues, the people of color that they're ministering to on this campus that are part of this campus don't want to have even the staff in the room when they're trying to talk about these issues. It's just they're so divided on just even how to talk about it. Can you help us? And so we went, and the first thing we did, we did this thing called the CQ assessment. We talked about that kind of before, but it's just a way to kind of measure where people are, and it gives you an idea of where you're starting from. And so I did this workshop with them, and it was real apparent, right? There's a lot of divided perspectives, a lot of spectrum there in the room where people are on both ends of, of almost all these different cultural perspectives. And as we talked about it, you could just tell there's a lot of underlying tension in that team. You know, it was just exposed through the measurement tool. And so when we got all done, I was reporting back to the senior pastor. He's like, what do you think we should do? I said, if it were me, I'd get them all in a room and lock them up and make them pray and worship together for like 24 hours. <laughs> and, 
And he goes, great, when can you do it? I'm like, <laughs> so, so anyway, we made time in the schedule and we just prayed like crazy, right? It's like, God, you're the one that's going to have to do this. And we went up and we started on a Friday night. All of Friday was just nothing but prayer and worship. Just beautiful, beautiful lifting up of Christ. Just like what we always say around here. Try to lift Christ up as much as we can. We focused on the family of God. We did communion together and brothers and sisters and all of this stuff for the first evening. That's all we did. I didn't say a word about tests or assessments or anything. Just lift up Jesus as high as we can, and it was a beautiful night. Next morning, we get up, and we start praying, and it's like, hey, put, express to God, who, do you, who would you like to see this campus be? What would you like to see happen out of this campus? And everybody started praying these beautiful prayers of oneness and unity and peace and harmony and all this stuff together, and then I was like, okay, who's willing to be honest about that in a prayer? Why don't you pray to God what your frustrations have been and why this is not happening? Awkward, long silence, pause, right? People were just sitting there thinking about it, but God was there in the room. His spirit was so present. And we just waited in silence. It felt like an eternity. Trust me, if you're facilitating one of these, it feels like an eternity. But finally, this young African-American female, first to pray out, and it was the most beautiful prayer. And it was, well, Lord, you know how frustrated I've been with many of the people even in this room. And if I'm really honest with you, I have withheld mercy because I was tired of waiting. Prayer number one. Prayer number two was the young millennial staff member, this guy. And, and you know, this is what I've seen about young millennials on the race issue. They're very open to the race issue. But where what they have, though, is like this perspective. It's like, why are we still talking about this? And, and a lot of them will have the, have the perspective, why can't you just get over it? You know, there's a, lot, there's a detachment from the pain and the real trauma that's happened in someone else's life. And that's the way a lot of the millennials were as they approached this issue. And that's why the people of color didn't want them in the room when they were talking about it. And they would largely think, hey, that's not my responsibility, right? This is an individualistic perspective. This is their problem. They need to get over it. And so that's kind of what you saw happening and just in terms of the interaction that this young man stood up and he prayed out and he said, Lord, forgive me for thinking it was just their problem. Because as we worshiped last night and I saw who the body of Christ is, I realized it's my problem, not just theirs. Beautiful bookend prayers. So we had them both come to the center of the circle. And I just said, okay, you heard these two prayers. You couldn't have asked for two more authentic prayers about what's happened here. How do you respond? Go to the person and pray with them. And immediately, almost all of the young millennial staff surrounded the young woman, African-American woman, and started praying with her. And almost all the other people of color surrounded the young man and started praying with him. And it was a beautiful time of prayer, probably, you know, 15, 20 minutes of prayer between these two groups. And they all came in kind of like just closed in their spirit. I don't know if those of you who, who think spiritually and are gifted in those areas, you know what I'm talking about when somebody walks in the room with a closed spirit. You know what that feels like and you can recognize it. And that's exactly where so many were. And when they got done with those two little groups, I said, okay, look around. Who else do you need to go pray that with? And they immediately just started 
gathering in groups and praying across the great barrier. And we probably spent another hour, an hour and a half in just reconciling prayer. And it was so incredibly beautiful. And when we were done, man, the, those closed spirits that were kind of like this were just like fully engaged in worship, shouting hallelujah to the Lord and worshiping God, hands raised, tears flowing down every face. And that's what God can do. Don't ever let anybody tell you Christ is not able to overcome the deepest divides of our day because he is and he can and he has and he will. Are you willing to be a part of that. It's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you your pride. It's going to cost you uncomfortability because the people that you are most frustrated with and that rub you the wrong way, that you don't understand, you are going to have to learn to love. In Jesus' name. So join us in the journey. It's the most difficult yet most fruitful and amazing journey ever, I'm convinced. It gives glory to God and it will help you fulfill your calling as his instrument. So Lord, we thank you for your word. It's amazing to me every time I read it, just how clear it is how it brings so much clarity to these very difficult and complex, volatile topics and how your spirit cuts to the quick. And we thank you, Lord, for Jesus, who in the moment, as our example, washed the feet of the very person that betrayed him, washed the feet of the people that they didn't understand who he was, wash the feet of those that would abandon him. Thank you for the Lord's example. I pray we could continue that process in this room and beyond, that we would be known as a body of Christ that you are just so alive and working in to such a degree that the rest of the world just goes, man, there's something going on there. there how they get that many different kinds of people to work together and to love each other is simply a miracle of God. And it is. It's your supernatural work, not our natural understanding. So I pray you would strengthen us to live it out, that you would strengthen us to keep trying, even when we fail. That we take into account where everybody else is and we would walk and work and worship together as one. So we love you, Lord. And we pray all of this in Christ's name. Amen.